What's going on? This is TJ Murphy and welcome to another episode of Adventurous Entrepreneurs. My guest today is Louise Scott, a dynamic entrepreneur and attorney whose career spans more than two decades at the helm of an eight-figure law firm. As the former COO and managing partner turned founder of eight-figure firm consulting, Luis has revolutionized the way legal professionals grow their practices and achieve predictable results. An esteemed author and sought-after speaker, he passionately advocates for innovative approaches within the legal field, empowering lawyers to not just practice law, but to lead with entrepreneurial spirit. Just a few of the golden takeaways Luis shares in this episode are the future of AI in legal and consulting industries, building businesses with integrity, strategic payroll management, which ultimately reduces costs and enhances business viability, and the marathon mindset in business, long-term perspectives, and the value of persistence. So without further ado, this is me and Luis Scott. Welcome to the Adventurous Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, TJ Murphy. Since quitting my corporate nine to five and starting a business while backpacking through Asia back in early 2017, I've had the privilege of learning from some incredibly adventurous entrepreneurs. Through these conversations and my own journey, I've learned that much like in life, entrepreneurship is an adventure. On this podcast, I explore the journeys of top performing leaders in their fields. These wide ranging conversations include tactical business advice, how I built this insights, lessons in leadership, life hacks, travel stories, favorite hobbies, and insights into living a purposeful and joy-filled life. Adventures await us, so let's dive in. Hey, hey, Luis, welcome to Adventurous Entrepreneurs. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Looking forward to our talk. Likewise, man. Been looking forward to this one all week. So I'd love to kick things off with just a little bit of background on on your journey. You know, you've you've had a lot of amazing experiences along the way. So can you tell us a little bit about your story from, you know, starting your career, being a managing partner at a successful law firm to founding eight figure firm consulting, which is what you're focused on these days? Yeah. I mean, even before becoming a managing partner, I had tried a lot of different businesses and I, I, I've always been a serial, serial entrepreneur. Uh, my very first, uh, I guess, foray into the entrepreneurial space was uh, I did things around the house. So I, I was the one that cut the grass. I, was, I washed the cars. I did some dry cleaning services. I ironed all my parents' clothes uh, for a whopping $20 uh, a week. I was, yeah, I was and we're not talking Hustling. about the 50s. We're, we're talking about, you know, the late 1990s. I was getting $20 a week, but it was it, the thing got me hooked on this idea that you could create some sort of benefit or service to other people and get paid for it. And I thought that was amazing. So I've always tried new businesses, but the way that I got into, into law was, you know, just a chance encounter with the judge and he gave me an internship. The next thing you know, I was hooked and I said, I want to own a law firm. And so I went to work at a firm and I believe that I had the true American dream. I started as a receptionist at a law firm and became the managing partner of that same law firm 15 years wow. later. That's and so amazing. that was my, my career. And obviously you learn a lot in 15 years and now 20 plus years in, in 24 years in the legal industry. Uh, I now help other people build their firms uh, to eight figures and beyond. So that's, that's the abridged version of how, how yeah. I got Man, talk about starting from the bottom. Now we're here, you know, yeah. not, not a very common thing these days from starting, you know, at, at that bottom rung in the totem pole and, and working your way all the way up in 15 years with the same firm. That's uh, it's pretty incredible, man. So re reflecting on, you know, your career, what was that turning point? Like you, you had success, you, mm -hmm. you did get to that pinnacle within your firm what made you want to transitional trans, well, transitional transition from you know doing the the legal practice to consulting and how did your experiences shape your approach to entrepreneurship? Well, so the the consulting thing started while I was still uh, an owner of a firm. So I, yeah. I had already been working as a consultant for a couple of years and and uh, I had the passion for consulting for a long time. I, I really wanted to be a teacher when I was coming out of uh, undergrad, but then I realized I didn't make any money. And so I've, I've always looked for a way to become a teacher again. And consulting is basically just teaching people how to shortcut the system. Uh, but for me, it was just this, how do I help people more deeply? And how do I help make a bigger impact in, in, in society? And uh, it wasn't a, a, an easy transition. Sometimes you, you see, the, see the light, sometimes you feel the fire. Yeah. And that firm that I was a, 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 an employee of for 15 years, 
we became very misaligned. The partnership did not have the same goals for the future. And so somebody had to leave and, and it was me and I ended up leaving and starting my own thing. I started another law firm that eventually uh, through some, some mergers went from nothing to almost 40 million in revenue. And that plus my 15 year experience with my first firm is what created the foundation for eight figure firm consulting. And the, the first book that I actually wrote, which is an ebook called the nine principles of exponential growth. And that's where that foundation was set. And so uh, it wasn't like a, an immediate transition. It was something that just happened organically over time. Hmm, I love it. I mean, especially the fact that yeah, you had a lot of success before you ended up leaving the firm where you were a partner, but you know, sticking to to your values, it sounds like things got out of alignment and you probably had some soul searching there that led you to say, you know what, I'm I'm gonna go off on my own. I'm gonna I'm gonna start something and build it the way I want to based on the direction I see myself wanting to head down in the future and, and the values that that you had. So like what's what's a lesson you learned in in the legal world that unexpectedly became invaluable as you set off on your own entrepreneurial journey? Well, you know, I think that this is really not just a lesson in the legal world, but but a lesson that can uh, be told by many, many entrepreneurs. And that is that you have to view your career as a marathon. It is, it is not, you know, most people would have been completely devastated by having to leave a place they had worked for for 15 years. And for me, I was like, I still have all my career left. I have my whole yeah. life left. We're just and, getting started, baby. <laughs> yeah, like I was just getting started. And so, yes, it was difficult and tough because I did think that I was going to be there for a really long, you know, a lot longer than that. But I learned that you, that if you view your business like a marathon and you and you have the right perspective, you're not going to be disappointed if in year one or two or year five or year 15, things don't work out because there's still so much opportunity in the marketplace. So that was probably one of the best lessons that I that I learned. But there was another lesson that I learned that I actually had heard from someone before, but then I actually experienced it. And that is, if you deal with an honest man, you don't need a contract. But if you deal with a dishonest man, a contract is not going to help you. And that is something that I've learned a really, that's a legal lesson that I've learned the hard way. Um, but I think it absolutely rings true. And so if you're an entrepreneur getting into business, and you're working with vendors or partners or anyone that you're in a contract with, make sure they're honest people and you'll yeah. never have to worry about that contract. It's so true. You know, you, you really do got to, got to trust the gut test in, in a lot of those things. You know, you're, you're talking to someone, you, you get the feels pretty, pretty early on, maybe not in the beginning, it's a little harder to, to know what to look for, but getting in business with the right people is certainly critical. You know, yeah. you're going to get burned along the way. So try to partner with with people that align with your mission and your values. But I loved how you described the marathon because I feel like so many people when they get into business, you know, they have this dream. They see they see Instagram, they see all these influential people out there and, and they're making it seem like there's a fast track. There's there's mm -hmm. shortcuts, which, of course, there are ways to do things better and more efficiently and and cut in line a little bit and get get faster results. But you got to think about the long term and designing your business intentionally where you're thinking about what it's going to look like a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, and not just having that mindset of, well, this thing's just going to take off overnight and we're going to yeah. figure it out along the way. If you're intentional about designing your business around the life that you want to live, how you want to serve, who you're going to help and, and what's your exit strategy, all of these things, it's a lot easier to not get jaded when things don't work out right away or, or when you do get burned along the way and it sets you back. So I know you talk about the importance of doing that type of work and like having a robust business plan. Could you share an example of, of how you went about that either yourself or how you lead some of your, your clients to, yeah. to have that plan and ultimately get the growth that they're, they're looking for? I'm a big proponent of business planning. And I always say it, it's the way that you remove the fog. You know, if you're driving down the road and you and the speed limit's 70 miles an hour and it's foggy, you better not go 70 miles an hour. You may end up hitting the person in front of you. But if it's a clear day, you can go 80 miles an hour. You can go 85 miles an hour, assuming there's no cops on the road. Mm -hmm. And so the business plan allows you to remove the fog so that you can have as much clarity as you can when you're going on this entrepreneurial journey. But I want to make a comment about, about this social media. You see people on Instagram living the life up. Um, the, the reality is if you want to shortcut your success, you got to fail faster. 
So you have to have more failure early on to have that level of success. But but the second thing is that a lot of people who are experiencing that level of success at a young age, um, they they have gone through things that we could have never um, imagined or have never gone through that had helped propel them. But it's an anomaly. You know, when you think about Mark Zuckerberg uh, creating Facebook, the reason it's so unique is because it's not natural. It's not normal. But what happens is that Instagram normalizes something that's not normal. We view 10, 15 people and we constantly see their stuff over and over and over. And we go, this must be everyone. It's, it, you know, uh, it, it's like uh, during spring break. If you right. go on social media during spring break, everybody's at the beach. Yep. But not everybody's so at the beach. Not everybody's no. at the beach. It's just 10 or 15 people are at the beach. And it seems like every time you scroll, somebody's at the beach. So we begin to believe that everyone's young and successful. And it's really not the case. The the, the saying that it takes 10 years to become an overnight success is absolutely true. Mm, because 100%. life experiences and seasons that you have to live in order to make that a reality. And for me, my first business took me 15 years to get to uh, three and a half million in revenue. My second business, it took me one year to get to a million in revenue. My third business, it took me six years to get to 40 million in revenue. My fourth business that succeeded, it took me two years to get to three and a half million in revenue. So like I've been, I've been speeding up my success every single time because I'm learning things uh, throughout the process. But business planning is how you do that. It's when you sit down and you think about what you want to accomplish and you're able to write down exactly what needs to happen to make that a reality. That's when you know that you have some sort of edge in creating the life that you want. But if you can't think about it, if you can't write it down, it's very likely that you're not going to be able to execute on it either. It's so true. I mean, you're talking about those 12, 15 influencers that you see on social media. We're talking like a fraction of a fraction of a percent of, yes. of people. So why are we comparing to those? And then even beyond that, like, you know, looking at yourself, for example, you've had a lot of failure. You've you've done this for a long time. And if somebody's just getting started and they're looking at someone like you, who's in chapter 30 of their yeah. journey and you're on chapter one, like go read the, read the book, find, yeah. find the clues that help them along the way, which is what this podcast is all about. But don't get discouraged because you're not where somebody else is that's had light years, more experience and failures and have had to go through it and have those lived experiences to get to the point where they're having multiple exits out of businesses and, and taking that, you know, much faster time to get to 3.5 million in revenue because you've learned things along the way. And now you're able to plan and, and get rid of the things that didn't work and stick to the things that you know are going to be effective in your business. Yeah. I mean, I, I had an employee one time who came to me and said that they were very disappointed because we were the same age and I was the boss and they were not. <clears throat> and, uh, and I said, we're the same age but I've been in the legal industry since I was 19. You've been in the legal industry for two years. So yes, we're the same age in terms of our natural life, but as it related to being in the industry, I had 10 times more time in the legal industry than you did. And so uh, we can't view ourselves based on our age, but rather based on our commitment to our craft. How long have I been committed to the craft? That's more indicative of where you should be in your career than how old you are. And I mm -hmm. think that's an important thing to know. So true. So true. And you mentioned an employee having that conversation with you and, you know, the power of the workforce as you're growing your company and, and, you know, really getting to scalability mode is so important. What are some strategies that you've employed yourself to identify and like foster winning employees, building the right team around you? I love talking about team. I was a sports yeah. guy. I played, uh, I played baseball in college. I love the power of the team. The team is is everything. And I think that uh, one of the things that I that I tell my my clients when I work with them is if you want a powerful team, you need to be intentional as a coach. And all too often as a leader of an organization, an owner, a founder, a coach, we, we aren't intentional about the way that we treat our team. And then we expect the team to perform at a high level. And, and unfortunately, that's not how it works. And so the first step in having a high octane, high impact team is being intentional about your purpose and your plan, which is the vision of the business, which is what you're going to stand for, who you're going to stand with, 
And what are the types of people that you want in your organization? So that's number one. Number two is clearly identifying the roles of every single person in the organization so that there's clarity about what they're responsible for and what their authority is. And number three is holding them accountable and being okay if you have to trade a player. Sometimes you can't have every player on your team. Sometimes you need to trade them to another team for some prospects to come later. And I think that you get at knowing who should be on your team and who shouldn't, holding people accountable, trading the ones that shouldn't be there, letting them know what their role is, but having a very clearly divine vision and purpose, the better your team is going to perform in the short and long term. Yeah, I love the sports analogy too. I'm a big, big sports guy. I played baseball. Didn't wasn't a college athlete, but you know, looking back, some of the lessons that I apply in my business around leadership and and fostering a good team environment and culture is like all things I've learned from my coaches over the years. And yeah, for me, I always fall back on all right, what what would my coach say in this moment? And sometimes I get some good epiphanies out of that. So I'm curious around that same topic. You know, you got the right people in place. Roles are clear. You know, you've you've traded up where needed. But culture is such a key component to the long term st- bit, like stability and sustainability and keeping people in that are the right people. So I'm curious, like, what is what's one strategy or something that you see people often overlooking? but is critical when come when it comes to building that culture and, and fostering a good team dynamic? Well, one of the things is uh, going back to intentionality. If you let the culture happen organically, it's not going to be the culture you want. Yeah. The culture you want has to be intentionally crafted and built. It's like a house. If I want a house to look a certain way, I got to have plans and I have to, I have to do certain things to, to make it look the way that I want. If I just let the general contractor decide how my house is going to look. It's going to look like they want it to look. Yeah. And all too often leaders are so busy with, with their, with their business. They're so busy trying to figure out how to grow it, how to sustain it, how to make revenue, how to, how to do production that they miss the setting the blueprint for their culture. And so I think if you want a really powerful culture, you need to ask yourself, what kind of culture do I want? So for me, I've always wanted a kind of a laid back culture. I, I I've, I tell people all the time, my goal was always to be able to come into work with a hoodie and to be respected. That was my goal. Like, that's the culture I want. Well, guess what? My team, they wear hoodies around the office. We do consulting calls. I very routinely am wearing a hoodie in a consulting call with a client who's paying me 10 grand a month. Like, that's just the way that I wanted to run it. That's the culture that we have. We have a jeans and hoodie culture. That's how, so, so here we are, a consulting company working with lawyers around the country that are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to work with us. And we're wearing hoodies and jeans. That's the culture that I wanted to have. And they respect it because we get them results. And so that was intentionally designed. And so if if you want a certain culture, ask yourself, what do I need to do to create it? And then make sure that you communicate that to your team. Mm, I love the intentionality piece. You know, anything that you set out to do, if you're not doing it with intention, if you're not designing and and actually mapping out play by play how it's going to look of course you're going to pivot along the way and things might change a little bit but you're just guessing you're throwing paint up on the wall and hopefully something sticks but it might not always so you seem like somebody who you know you were an athlete you you had coaching all throughout your your youth and i would assume as you moved into your career you've you've been someone that invests heavily in, in professional development as well is that true Oh, yeah. I mean, I started coaching over 10 years ago in professional settings. Obviously, I've had coaches my whole life in sports settings, but professionally 10 years ago, and I've never stopped. And I'm always uh, dumbfounded when somebody's like, I got all the coaching I need. I don't need any more coaches. And, And I'm thinking, wait a second, the number one golfer in the world still has a coach 25 years into his career. Uh, uh, all the best players, Kobe Bryant had a coach, Michael Jordan had a coach, like all these best players in the world have coaches, but you with your, with, with your seven figure business, barely making that much money, you don't need a coach. I, I got it. Okay. I understand. Yeah, sure. it, it, it's beyond me. It's, I think it's the greatest secret to success. We talked about shortcuts. Coaching is one of those shortcuts. They can see things that you can't see. I started working with a, with a client just recently and she told me that her payroll budget was 62% and that they needed more employees. I said, before you get more employees, I want you to map out for a week what every employee was doing. So every employee had to document every single thing that they were doing. You know what happened here. We found out that on average, they were working 25 hours a week, right? They didn't need more people. They needed to reorganize and be held accountable. 
So not only were they not going to hire anybody, they were able to offload 10 people, reduce their payroll budget, and, be, and still work as efficiently as they were before. The coaching mattered because I was able to give her an exercise that would help her relieve her payroll budget. And now we believe that we're going to get the payroll budget down to 50% in less than six months. That's wow. incredible. It's huge savings for a business that's going to do 20 million in revenue. And so it's really important to have coaching because they see things without the, the emotional attachment that we sometimes have to the business. Mm, yeah. And, you know, with that example, especially like, it's not just the impact on you as an individual, like that carries out into the firm and, and the success of the company and everybody in it. You know, I'm sure the people that were only working 25 hours and not feeling like they were fulfilled completely in that role might, might've been thinking about other opportunities and yeah, it sucks to get rid of people, but look at all that profit that now gets to get reinvested in the business and growth and, and bringing in more high level people. I would imagine long-term to really step in and grow it to the next level. So what's, what's interesting about getting rid of people is I, I've always said that uh, people self-select, I don't fire them. They self-select because if they were an A player and really put in their heart and soul into the business, I would never have to let them go. And yeah. so they've decided that they don't want to work hard. And so now I'm having to help you with your decision. Uh, and I think that, that when you look at terminations that way, uh, it's a lot less painful as, an, as a business owner. Because uh, if, if they were all working at full capacity, I wouldn't have to get rid of them. We as business owners always keep our top talent. Just make sure you're the top talent. Amen. So I read in preparation for this, something that you said at one point of like having a mindset of a marketer mm -hmm. and how that can be a game changer for, I mean, in my opinion, all professions, you know, too many business owners don't have that marketing hat, but for legal practices, cause that's your realm of, of expertise. Like how does that having a mindset of being a marketer have an impact for, for those types of people? In the legal industry specifically, people used to think if I just do a good enough job, people are going to hire me. You know, if they build it, they will come. That doesn't work anymore. The best cases go to the best marketers. The majority of the cases go to the best marketers. So you have to view your business first as to how do I attract people into my business? And so I always say that the goal that you have in your business is to create the most amount of awareness that you can. And I always ask every, every lawyer, I ask them the same thing. And I ask every business owner the same thing. What was the first thing that you did when you opened your business? And every one of them say the same thing. I told people about my business. I told people about my business. Well, guess what? It works at scale. The more people you tell about your business, the more clients you're going to get. And so you have to have the mindset of a marketer that marketing is all about creating awareness and creating attention for your product and your service so that more people can hire you. If they don't know you, they can't hire you. And so you have to be known in the community. And it's your responsibility to do that as an owner. Yeah. Preaching my language as a marketer. Yeah. The loudest tends to be the the company that wins at the end of the day. People don't know you. They can't do business with you. They can't find you. They can't do business with you. So you got to focus on on the brand and, and the marketing side just as much as you focus on the clients and providing that great experience. And you know, another thing I've I've just picked up in in researching kind of your journey is like the importance of of showing up consistent, persistent action every day. And, you know, we've alluded to it. Not every day is a good day. There's there's highs and lows. So how do you maintain that mindset, especially during tough times that allows you to just keep showing up and, and doing the work that you know you need to do? Three things, coaching, reading, and inspiring myself through audio. I think those are the biggest things. You're going to have up, up days. You're going to have down days. Uh, you're going to have days where you don't feel that motivated. And there has to be something else. And, and discipline, uh, there's like studies done on the will. Your will is, starts to uh, erode as the day goes on, as the trials go on, as the difficulties go on. So we can't depend on our will. We can't depend on our discipline. Well, we have to depend on other things to get us up and going. And so I depend on my coach who holds me accountable. I depend on a consistent reading habit that gives me the opportunity to, to hear the words of somebody who's gone through things. And then I just, I put on my headset and I just start listening to things that inspire me. Uh, I go to uh, Motiversity, uh, Motivation Diversity. I mean, whatever I have to listen to, YouTube, uh, audio, uh, you know, Spotify, whatever I have to listen to, 
to in, it put in my mind that everything's going to work out. And so I start listening to that over and over, reprogramming my subconscious so that I start believing. And what I've realized is the, the greater the belief, the greater the result, not the greater the action. See, in my 20s, I used to grind, 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 rise and grind, rise and grind, mm-hmm. early the worm. I was stressed and frustrated all the time because I was like not a millionaire. I'm like, I'm 25. Why am I not a millionaire? I'm working 70 hours a week. And what I realized is it's not about how many hours you work, but how efficiently those hours are for you and, and how efficiently you use your time. And so I used to be rise and grind. Now I'm rise, make coffee, make breakfast, uh, maybe read a little bit, uh, get my mind right. And then I mm-hmm. focused on the things that move the needle. And that's given me better results uh, over time now that I'm more fo- laser focused than I was before. Yeah. I mean, keeping into the kind of sports analogy, you know, I liken that to all elite athletes for the most part have their pregame ritual. They have their routine, right? They're, they're doing certain things in the exact same order every time before they get out there on the court or take the field, listening to the pump up music, doing the same stretching routine, positive affirmation, visualization, you know, everybody's got a little bit different, but having that same intentionality to how you start your day is going to allow you to squeeze so much more out of, we all got the same amount of hours in the day, right? Some are going to burn the candle on both ends and it might work 70, 80 hour weeks. And sure, maybe there's a season for that. And if you can be efficient in that amount of time and, and maximize everything, the more power to you, but you can also do it with a lot less time and you got to set yourself up for that type of success by getting your mind right so that you can be stable throughout the day. So I love that you share that. That's a big thing in, in my wife's mind right now, as she's thinking about like workplace culture and how can she foster the right leadership style for herself that can carry through to her team. And it's embodying those types of habits of, of not being somebody who's showing up and sending emails on the weekend or, you know, having the, you know, face to her, her customers and to her team that she's working late into the night because she's not. And when she has to, she'll like schedule that stuff out because it's important for them to see her embody those leadership traits and, and having that blend of, of work and life in a harmonious way. So. Yeah. I I think there's a time for grinding, but I think that there's also a time for you to uh, uh, have a little bit more balance in your life because yeah. if you grind forever, you're going to be stressed out the whole time. Yeah. Amen to that. And that's a good segue. It's a question I always ask you know, on this podcast, you know, we're talking about entrepreneurship, but at the end of the day, one of the biggest hurdles we all face is living a, a well-rounded, a well-blended life, however you want to look at it, but doing the things that bring us joy with the people that we care about most and doing that with intentionality. So, what does living a, a well-rounded life look like for you? How are you able to kind of keep, I'm sure, a very busy schedule and, and high pressure situations with your clients, with the things that, that you really care about and, and help fill you back up? Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, I, I say it's the four Fs. It's uh, my, my faith, my family, my friends, and my finances. And so if, if I can feel successful and satisfied with my faith, with my family, with my friends and my finances, I feel like I'm living a well-rounded life. And so uh, sometimes it means today, this didn't used to be the case when I was running two businesses and and didn't have as much time. But today it's being able to cook breakfast with my family. Today it's being able to take a walk in the middle of the day. Uh, It's it's being able to have dinners with my family consistently instead of being at work. Uh, uh, Being able to to be around people who inspire me. Uh, Making sure that that I'm not striving for this, you know, unlimited amount of cash just to make money. Like I'm striving for what I need for my life and to secure my, my kids in school and so forth. Um, and so I'm more, much more well-rounded in that sense. It's because I'm looking at these four areas of my life and making sure I can feel satisfied every day that I'm hitting these things. I love that. Can we dive in a little bit into like the tactical, like, do you have any rules or like systems that allow you enable you to yeah cook breakfast for for your family in the morning and be able to take that time off in the day and not have work constraints kind of eating into that that quality time that you want to have yeah so what so there, there's several things that i did um that have helped me the first thing is i don't schedule meetings before 9 a.m 
which gives me the time to cook breakfast. My kids get up at seven. So I, we cook breakfast at seven. It's much easier to do that. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I try as hard as I can to not have any meetings on Mondays and Fridays. So Mondays and Fridays, that give me the ultimate flexibility. And if I have a meeting, it's one or two meetings, but the majority of the day is my day. I can go to the gym. I can do uh, things for myself. I can get the car washed. I can, you know, uh, go on walks. I can spend time with my kids. I can take my kids to, to, to school. I can, you know, pick them up. And so clearing my calendar and working focus time uh, in my week. So Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays are my real, my real uh, big days. So those are the days from nine to five, sometimes nine to six, I'm all in on work and on those days. So clearing my days on Monday and Friday, making sure I don't start meetings before nine, making sure I finish meetings by six, uh, and then scheduling things in. Because if it's on my calendar, I do it. If it's not, a lot of times I'll just, uh, I'll just skip it. And so those, those have been the things that really keep me on track. Yeah. Coincidentally, I do all those things too. Yeah. <laughs> no meetings before nine. And Sometimes I'll have some Monday meetings, but Fridays keep my schedule clear. Mondays have a couple internal meetings, but try not to have any external meetings. That just allows me to really start the week with intention and and have things mapped out. I've got my schedule right for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday to hit it hard. And then Friday, you know, if I want to cut out of work and go go skiing or, or go paddle boarding, yeah. I've, I've earned it hopefully by then and have that flexibility to do it. So Louise, I got a choose your own adventure question for you here. So okay. you can you can pick which one you'd like to answer or or both if you so desire. But first, like what's a, a favorite trip that you've gone on recently, you know, past five years or could be any old time or second, just like a recent adventure you went on could be, you know, in your own neighborhood, your own backyard, something you did on the weekend with your family. But in either case, what was it like? What made it so memorable? Maybe a, a favorite meal or drink you had a lesson learned. Give us a story. So my 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 favorite uh, trip was probably the last trip we just recently took uh, to Puerto Rico, and um, uh, we we travel a lot. So I I uh, I try to go on between five and seven vacations a year, just because I do work pretty hard in between that time. So you need that that relaxation. But this last trip, um, it, we had rented a, a really big house, and because we thought our parents were coming, and then they ultimately did not end up coming, and so we, we it was just us in this really big house. So we invited some friends last minute and they showed up uh, nice. in Puerto Rico. They flew from Atlanta to Puerto Rico to join us. But what made it super special is I didn't want anybody to do anything on the trip. So we hired a, a chef who cooked every meal for us the entire week. And yeah. was yeah. it was absolutely, it was a massive pool overlooking the ocean on the west side of the island with a, with a private chef for the whole week. And it was just absolutely amazing. And it's got me thinking. I probably need the private chef full time. So we <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> don't we all? So, but just having that chef, you know, cooking for us and allowing us to on vacation, you know, he would prepare lunch and we would eat lunch and then we'd go on a long walk to the beach and didn't have to clean up anything. That was just, yeah. it was super memorable and uh, just a lot of fun. Man, it sounds awesome and really cool that you got to bring your friends in for for that experience. I'm sure they had an awesome time as well. Puerto Rico is somewhere I definitely want to get to here in the near future. Um, it's always been on my list. And are, do you have ties to, to Puerto Rico? Yeah, or? so I'm actually originally from Puerto Rico and I, okay. I moved when I was 13. And and uh, so my family lives on the east side of the island. We go every year. I wanted my kids to grow up going to Puerto Rico. Um, this year, weirdly, we're going three times. So I, this was actually my second time already this year that I've gone. Um, but we're going to go one more time this summer. And so uh, we love the island. It's uh, it's a great time. It's sunny. It's 82 degrees year round. I mean, you just can't beat it. So yeah, we love paradise. Yeah. I'll have to pick your brain when uh, I finally plan a trip out there. Yeah. So as we wrap up, kind of a, a last tactical question here, just in your sphere, like looking ahead, what's what's one trend or change that you foresee is going to shake things up in you know, either the legal or the the consulting world that that people in those spaces should be preparing for now? Um, I think that this is really just general uh, business advice. There's going to be a lot of consolidation as, as technology takes over a lot of the jobs that can be automated. And I think people need to be prepared for doing more and being more efficient with technology. I'll give you an example, like content writing right now with AI, with chat GPT has made it so much more streamlined, uh, not necessarily 
I don't want you to use all the, the chat GPT to, to write your content, right? But but when it comes to video creation, I can go on chat GPT. I can say, give me 10 topics to talk about as it relates to marketing. And then I can use those prompts to record a video. And so it's making it so much easier to come up with ideas uh, that you can use in, in content. And so if people are still relying on their, on their own ability to create ideas, I think that they're going to be left behind. Um, Recently, I used ChatGPT and I said, give me 30 uh, topics to talk about as it relates to consulting law firms. And within a matter of seconds, it was like, here are all the topics. And then I was able to use that topic. Now, it didn't give me the what to say. It just gave me the topic. I was able to use that to create content. So I think that that's something that's changing the consulting business. I think it's changing the legal business. I think it's going to be relevant in almost every industry. And so if you're an entrepreneur, you should be thinking about how am I going to incorporate AI and technology into my business so I don't get left behind. 100%. And everyone's talking about it. If you're sleeping on it, it's time to, to go open a chat GPT account at the very least and start playing around because yep. if you're not incorporating AI into your workflows, as Luis just said, like everybody else, at least your, your biggest competitors will be, and that's going to streamline their process to a fraction of the time to achieve in a lot of cases, an even better outcome. So yep. It's got to happen. It's got to happen. Luis, where can people find and support you online? Website, socials, things like that. What's the best place for people to reach out? Yeah, you can find all my links at luisscottjr.com, L-U-I-S-S-C-O-T-T-J-R.com. All my links, my books, uh, everything to do with, uh, with me and the consulting business there. Awesome. Well, we'll put links to everything in the show notes. So it's easy for people to find you. And dude, thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate you dropping some wisdom on us. A lot of golden nuggets in here, value bombs. So hope people were taking notes and definitely reach out to Luis if you're looking for some additional support. Definitely the man to talk to. To all of our adventurous listeners, thank you for tuning in to today's episode. Please be sure to subscribe, download, and share this on social media or with someone you know will get some value from it. Leaving a review goes a long way in helping people find the show. And I personally appreciate reading them when they come in. So please go drop one if you have the time. We'll see you all next week. And remember, whether we're talking about business or the things that bring us joy outside of work, life is meant for exploring. So go out there and live it one adventure at a time.